so the difference between what we have done in <clears throat> the analysis of beams, design of slabs, and design of footings. Just <clears throat> quickly refresh our memory. So what we did in beams that we had a section. Okay, moment. So we had a section. We knew what the reinforcement was, and then we found out what was MUR. Okay, this was in question. This is what we did in beams. In slabs, so we analyzed beams. We did not design beams. Okay, when we say analysis, we know the section and we find out how much it can take. In design, it's it's a reverse process. So we know the demand and then we design a section that can carry it. So we did the analysis of beams. We did not. We have not looked at the design of beams. Then we designed slabs. And in the design of slabs, the only thing that we knew was loading and the span. From that, we computed what was the demand. So this is what we knew. Okay. And then we found out what should be the depth of the slab and what should be the area of reinforcement. So these things were unknowns and, and and we found those out. How did we find the depth? Based on the deflection criteria. We found the depth and then <clears throat> we have that, you know, we looked at the, the the large formula wherein if we know the depth and the moment, we can always find out area. What we are doing in footings is again, we are designing footings. Uh, here, we, we know what is the demand, that we know what is the actual load, and we know what is the safe bearing capacity of soil. From that, we calculated what is what is the plan area of the footing. So we have computed the plan area. The next thing that we have to calculate is what is the depth. The depth of slab was based on deflection criteria. But here, deflection is not really, uh, you know, a criteria per se. So the question is how to find out the value of D or how to find out deflection. Now, uh, if I go back, mm -hmm. yeah. So if I go back to the formula of moment, <clears throat> yeah, here. So we know how to find out moment. We know how to, you know, calculate the moment of resistance when I know width, when I know depth, and you know the depth of neutral axis and so on. But now here, what we know is, we know what is the moment, we know FCK, we know width, because yeah, we, we already found out the plan dimensions, and therefore we know what is, what is the width. But we do not know what is XU, we do not know what is D, okay? But what we do know is the maximum values of XU. What we do know is this, that the maximum moment that we can permit that section to resist is equal to mu max, which is this formula 0.36 FCKB into XU max. We also know what is XU max for a certain grade of or certain grade of steel in terms of its total depth. So even just to quickly go back to that, we have seen it here that for Fe 250, it is 0.53D, 415.48, 500.46. Something wrong here. Yeah, 0.46 and 550.44. So basically, everything except D is now known in the equation. The only thing that is unknown is D. Okay, so this this was just for your information. You don't write it at the exam. The grade of steel is Fe415. We know that for Fe415, XU max is equal to 0 0.48 times of T. Therefore, MU max is equal to 0 0.36 into FCK into B into 
x max and we have to multiply this entire thing by the liver arm which is d minus 0 0.42 times x u max now what we have to do we have to replace x u max everywhere with 0 0.48 d so this is equal to 0 0.36 into f c k into width into x u max max times uh, d is uh, sorry, sorry sorry so this is 0 0.48 times d and this whole thing times d minus 0 0.42 into 0 0.48 into d that's all so this is equal to 0 0.36 into fck into whatever is the width 0 0.48 we can bring d out from there and it can be into uh, d square and then the only thing that is left is 1 minus 0 0.42 times 0 0.48 so 0 0.36 Uh, <clears throat> we can combine everything in one go 0.36 into 1 minus 0 0.42 to 0.48 which is equal to this into 0.48 so it is equal to 0 0.138 into fck into bd square So now in this formula, we know everything except D. <clears throat> so just putting all the values, 1 by 91.14 uh, into, so we have to be consistent in units. This is a very common mistake. Since everything, so FCK is in Newton per mm square, which is megapa megapascals. B is in mm, D is in mm, therefore this has to be in Newton mm. Therefore, 0 0.138 into FCK is 30 into width. Now, the dimensions that we have chosen is 0. Point, is 3.5 meters. So if you look at this, the width of this section is 3.5 meters. You look at in this section. So this is your bending moment and the width is what it, it is in plane. So your width is 3.5 meters. So into three five double zero into d square. Okay, can someone please give me a value of d? Come on, anyone? Value of D? A few seconds. Yeah, okay. 0.3313. Sorry? 0.3313. It cannot be that small, right? Root uh, into 10 to 6, actually. So 0 0.3313 into 10 power 6. It cannot be that big. 331.3. Yeah, okay. 331.3. Yeah. So 331.36, we can write it as 331.4 mm. So this is the minimum depth that is to be provided. Now, just like we did in slab, we found out what was the span to depth ratio. We got the minimum value of D. Okay. There's no need for us to imagine that. We already have everything. Yeah. So we found out what is the minimum depth, 160 mm. Then we found out what is the capital D. 
and we just back calculated what is actual you know uh, effective depth that we have provided so minimum depth is 331 we have to calculate what is the so so minimum effective depth is 331 we have to calculate the minimum depth so this is equal to d plus uh, bar bar diameter dia plus sphere cover now you might wonder as to why i have taken bar dia and not bar diameter by 2 like i have taken in slabs here with we said bar diameter by 2 because we designed a one way slab and in a one way slab there's only you know reinforcement in one direction that is important to us therefore when we calculate d it's uh, half the rebar plus clear cover but here we provide reinforcement in both the directions so what you effectively have is this is our section this is the reinforcement in one direction and this is our reinforcement in the other direction and both of them are main reinforcement you know is this there's no different different difference here so the average depth is at the perhaps i'll, I'll use this small marker so the average depth is at the center of both these so this depth is uh Uh, the bar diameter, the entire bar diameter, plus the clear cover, and therefore, here it is D plus bar diameter plus clear cover. Uh, now the question is, which what bar, bar diameter to use? Normally, we have observed that for typical building, 16 mm dia, 20 mm dia suffices. 20 gives us a better number, so let's let's assume 20. So 331.4 plus bar diameter 20 plus clear cover. Now I've said that the minimum clear that is to be used is 50 mm, but practically what we do is we at least provide 75 mm. So this is the minimum depth. So 331.4 plus 20 plus 75, it is 426.4 mm. Okay. So how much depth will you actually provide? Should I provide four hundred? Four fifty. Yes. So we have to approximate it. So it is. We have to approximate it to four fifty mm. In multiples of twenty five. So it is approximately four fifty mm. So this is our total depth. <clears throat> so now, basically, we are at a position. wherein we know the moment we know the depth now the only thing that we have to calculate is area so basically this is what happens after the first step in slabs so in the slabs we use the deflection criteria to find out the depth and the, perhaps this case does not apply here because we already know the loading and then we just found out what is the reinforcement so from here everything is same So the third step is the design of flexible reinforcement. So, um, like I've said this before, and I say it again, that normally the depth of reinforced concrete footings is governed by shear criteria. To you know, just to give you a sense of what I'm saying. So, if the depth that you get from flexion criteria is 450 mm. perhaps you might get a depth of around 600 650 mm from shear criteria and that is the depth that we actually provide but here since we are not looking into shear we are not you know uh, really bothered about what what is the depth that we get from shear but that in most of the cases is definitely more than 450 mm so now we have to design a flexural reinforcement we just calculate uh, what is the actual effective cover so this is equal to capital d minus bar dia minus clear cover so 
this is equal to 450 minus 20 minus clear cover is 75. So this is equal to 355 m. So this is our actual depth, actual effective depth. <clears throat> now we have to use our so-called Thanos formula, this one. So AST is equal to 0.5 FCK by FY BD into 1 minus square root of 1 minus 4.6 MU upon FCK BD squared. <clears throat> Might look scary at the first, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. You can just you know, save a lot of time if you learn this. So now all you have to do is plug in the values. So this is equal to 0 0.5 times FCK upon FY into B, our B is 3500 into D which is 355 okay. uh, into 1 minus square root of 1 minus we have to be consistent with the units. Our design moment is uh, 1592, I believe, 1591, 15, 9, 1.14. 1, 5. I have to write this again. <clears throat> 1594.1 into 10 power 6 so that it is in Newton mm and we have to divide it by FCK BD square. FCK is 30, B is 3500. And <clears throat> d square is 355 square. Okay, now the task is quickly give me an answer for AST. For Bharga, yeah. is it 1591.14 mu? Okay, I'll just check. 1591.14. So 1591.14. Yeah. Into 10 power 6. I thought you already had an answer and I was really surprised. 3500. Is it two seven eight six? Two seven eight six. Okay, perhaps it, this might this looks small to me. <clears throat> Anybody else? Come on, by this time, you should be, you know, really fast with these calculations. Come on, no one's got it. What is it? 2786.4. 2786. Okay. Again, this looks small to me.
perhaps I'll just check my calculations again. Two six nine four point five. Okay, so another answer that we have is two six nine four. Okay, so the answer that I have got is fourteen thousand eight 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 mm square. Um, don't we need to multiply the mu term by four point six? I think we haven't done that. Oh, it is because of that that you are getting a different answer. So you have to multiply this by four point six. Can you just recheck? <clears throat> Getting this now? Yes. Okay. So this is our answer. So we have to provide fourteen thousand eight hundred mm square of reinforcement along the entire width. That is what it means. Before the uh, before we actually provide this, there's something that we should check. Now, if you remember, we talked about minimum reinforcement and that the minimum reinforcement is 0.12% if it is 415 and it is 0.15% if it is FE 250. So, the AST that the AST minimum that is to be provided is 0.12% of BD of the gross area. So this is equal to 0 0.12 divided by 100 into uh, can someone answer which is the gross area that we are talking about or what is the gross area here? Or what is the area of the section here? Basically what I am asking is what is AG? So 0.12% of what is the minimum area? Okay, if you have understood anything about flexure, you should be able to answer this question. Now it's pretty simple that, you know, all the cards are on the table. We know all the dimensions. So the only thing that I'm asking is when I say gross area, which area am I talking about? Nobody? Oh, excellent. No, that cross sectional area? Yes, 3. it's a cross. multiplied by the height, uh, depth. Yes, it is a cross section area. So this is our column. Okay, we are working in this plane. So basically, this is nothing but a beam that if I, you know, look in the section, if I look it in the section, so this is my beam which has a width of 3500 and has a depth of 450. Okay, so this is my beam section. I'm going to provide reinforcement here. Okay, shouldn't have taken so long for you to answer this question. So this is my beam. Now it might look a little odd, but this is the width of that beam. This is in plan. This is the width of that beam. This is the span and this is the depth. 
so when we say gross area i look at the cross section of the beam and this is the gross area okay so 0.12 divided by 100 into 3500 into 450 an answer please Uh, 1.89 into 10 to power 5. 5? Like Perhaps. 189 to 3. 1.89 10 to 3. Okay, so 1890 mm square. That is the area we have to provide. But what we are actually providing is 14 triplet, which is you know much more than the minimum area. <clears throat> Therefore, AST, which is provided, or what we have calculated, is greater than AST minimum. Therefore, we are okay. Oh, the design is okay. Therefore, I have a question. In the paper, are we going to get uh, this uh, square footing only or rectangular also? Historically, you have been getting square footing. Uh, if I look at all the question papers before, it's all square column. I it, it might be, you know, you might be short of time in case you get a rectangular footing. But, you know, we have shortcuts for everything. So perhaps after we finish this, I'll give you a shortcut as to how you can uh, take care of a rectangular footing. <clears throat> so... Now, the only thing is you have to compute what, how many bars to provide and uh, how much spacing to provide and so on. Just a moment. So if we provide 20 mm diapas, the number of bars required is of course the total area divided by area of each bar. So this is equal to AST upon area of each bar our AST is 1488. So this is 14888. And the diameter of 120, uh, the diameter of 20 mm diameter bar is 5 by 420 square, which is approximately 314. So So the total number of bars turns out to be 47.4, which is approximately equal to 48. So we have to provide 48 number of bars here. Now, naturally, we should find out how much is the center to center spacing. So if this is my footing, oh. I'm going to be placing the bars in both the directions. 48 bars in each direction. I just have to co compute that what is the spacing of this. So, <clears throat> so this dimension is clear cover plus P by 2 this dimension is also the same. The dimension of the first bar from the edge. So this is clear cover plus P by 2. Now I want to calculate what is the center to center spacing. Now this is the total width. So naturally I have to uh, subtract these from this and then divide by the total number of bars. So the center to center spacing So 
center to center spacing is equal to the total width. Perhaps I'll just denote this by width since we're using beef here. <coughs> So you can you can denote it as L or small b or you know whatever helps you understand. So this is the total width minus uh, two times of this clear cover <coughs> plus p by two divided by number of bars minus one. Okay, because of the bars are 48, the spacings are 47. And therefore, B minus 2 times of center to center spacing, number of bars minus 1. So please just plug in the values. B is 3500 minus 2 times, clear cover is 75, plus bar diameter by 2 is 10, number of bars is 48, 48 minus 1 is 47. So the spacing is approximately equal to 70 mm. 70.85 yes that. yes correct very good fast calculation so this is 70 mm so that is the spacing that we have provided now the reason why we found this out is because of the clause that says that the maximum spacing should not be greater than 300 mm so this is 300 m less than 300 mm therefore we are okay so this was just to check nothing else So if you if you are in a position that you don't have time, if you're you know if you have short of time in the exam, you perhaps might just skip this step. Okay, I'm just saying because this is not naturally you're providing so much reinforcement. There are 48 bars, so you can just quickly you know divide 3500 divided by 47 and yeah find 74 or something. So you are basically providing a spacing that is way less than 300. You you get a feel of it, you know. So you might just skip this step in case you are short of time. OK, this is not a very important check. Of course, it is important, but with the numbers that you know we are dealing with, we, we, just, we can just get a feel that we are way within 300, and therefore this is fine. We are providing 20 mm diameter bars as 70 mm. That's pretty close. OK, so we have everything we need now, but the only thing that that needs to go on the site is not all these calculations, but an actual section. Therefore, we're gonna draw an actual section. So first thing is that we have to show the footing in plan. So that's our 3500 by 3500 footing. Now we have to you just don't draw these lines. I'm just drawing them for, for evidence. So this is our 500 by 500 column. Okay. Now what we are going to do is draw a section here.
so this is our section <clears throat> now we have to provide So don't you know waste your time by actually drawing forty eight rivers. This is just a sketch. You show to the invigilator that you have understood. Okay, so this is the riba that you show in see in line is actually the riba in this direction, like this. And the rebar that you see in circles is the rebar in this direction. Okay, so just a few more details to add here. First is, of course, how much reinforcement that that you are providing. <clears throat> So we are providing 48 number, 25 mm diameter, both ways. Then, of course, the most important thing is the total depth of the footing which is 450 and then perhaps not very important but still it's it's worthwhile to have it in the section that we are providing a clear cover of 75 mm everywhere okay now in a good detailing you will also see the rebar from column so you know just for the sake of it Show the C bar. So this is our final section. So any questions here? <clears throat> okay. I had earlier in earlier part. Yeah, go on. While calculating AST, my value came out to be uh, 13,921, which you calculated are 14,888. So is okay. that much deviation possible or because I rounded out at <clears throat> some uh, at, uh, square root value well, thing. That value I rounded off to. You know, the best thing to do is, is the best thing to do is, you know, use a calculator and do this entire thing in one shot. So you don't have to approximate at intermediate stages. So, uh, you know, a normal uh, mistake that I've seen students making is, uh, at least in the class, I don't know how they do it in the exam, 
but uh, you know they go step by step like we did in school so to get they calculate numerator first then denominator then square root and then one minus that and then the other thing and then they multiply it it's it's a you know royal waste of time you just in a calculator you can do it in a single shot you know i i hope you i hope you guys know how to do it you know how to use a calculator right mm, not this kind of big thing like uh, square root 1 minus this upon this you know whole shot <laughs> okay so you know if you are using scientific calculators uh are, are you using scientific calculators okay that's one step back not right you know, now but I do you know do you guys know what yeah. a scientific calculator is Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know it, right? So, yeah. uh, if you if you happen to have them, there is a certain mode that you can set up. And using this mode, you can write this as you can see in, on the screen in your calculator. And you know, as you do it, it 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 will not take more than a few seconds. So perhaps uh, now, I cannot. Uh, I I'll just see if I can get a digital scientific calculator. and if i do perhaps in the revision lecture we can look at how to use a scientific calculator to you know solve equations like this without having to approximate the intermediate steps okay but to answer your question uh it should not really matter if we are doing it in steps or you know we are doing it in one shot uh, if you are approximating something the value should be you know more or less within plus minus 2 3% so uh you know in 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 the week of this question is there anybody else who has got an answer as 14888 or is it just me yeah i also got it yeah. okay then then perhaps uh, perhaps is the right answer and you might, you just might want to recalculate this so okay. yeah any more questions here so now we have looked at you know beams slabs columns footings anything else so what is the take away from all this you know in terms of solving your exam what is the take away so the nature of the question paper is like you first get a theoretical uh, question 10 marks or 15 marks Oh, is it 20 marks? I don't know. Yeah, I think it is 20 marks. So the 20 marks of theory, and then you get four questions out of which you have to solve two. So naturally, one question is related to beams. The second one is related to columns. The third one is related to slabs, and the fourth one is related to footings. So out of those four, you have to solve any two. <clears throat> so, what is the takeaway? we have we have talked about beams columns slabs and footings we have looked at all the numericals perhaps you 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 know you really want to refresh your memory and go through all the numericals once again <clears throat> but i would what in terms of you know saving time and scoring better what i would recommend is come what may do not miss the column question it won't take more than you know 10 minutes tops because the procedure is very straightforward uh you see the design of rcc columns just in two slides we have sort of completed the design it's very straightforward and there's you know nothing challenging that you can face here so come what may do not you know leave this question you know solve this for sure if you have to you know among the other three beam slabs and footings procedure wise design of or analysis of beams is the shortest okay uh, perhaps i'll go at a numerical that we solved yes so this is the beam numerical two slides it's done so if you have if you if i have to suggest you you know an order in which you can look or you can uh, and you can you sharpen your skills to solve numericals i would suggest go for columns first then you can look at design of beams okay if you're pretty comfortable with both of them then you can look into slabs because you know design of slabs is also straightforward you just have to find out what is the depth using this 
and then nothing three slide stops so we have finished everything in three slides so and even after that you feel the only problem with slabs is you you're going to spend some time in you know detailing this the sketch is going to take some time but in beams this this no sketch because you already know everything the sketch is the sketch is given the data is given there's nothing that you know you have to provide therefore that's that's the simplest thing in beams you don't have a uh, sketch per se you don't have to give a final drawing in columns you have to but this is very simple very straightforward don't take more, much time in slabs you might have to spend some time in in, in drawing the section so uh, but considering the simplicity of the procedure in slabs this would be third on my list and then fourth would be footing and uh, the reason being it's it's a little lengthy uh, and you know you have to uh, sort of understand the analysis first when i say analysis i mean you have to understand how to get the design moment so you know this perhaps this will be fourth on my list now there was a question as to what do we do if we get a rectangular footing so perhaps i would answer this question uh, so if you get a rectangular column so you get a column like this so but you always have an option you can provide a rectangular footing practically a rectangular footing is provided when you have a rectangular column but this is not uh, this is not a practical situation you don't have to give an actual footing so irrespective of the footing being rectangular or square you can always provide a square footing so irrespective of what is the area you can get you can provide both sides technically it is not going to be incorrect the only thing is see point, the, basically we have to be right in terms of our understanding and we have to be right in terms of theory as of now okay so if even if you get a rectangular column you can provide a square footing now the only trick here is which section will you consider or which moment will you consider when i say that what i mean is now you have two axes so this is your uh, this is your x axis and this is your y axis okay so now the column is rectangular the footing is square so which moment will you consider will you consider mx or will you consider my okay uh, strictly speaking we have to consider both moments we have to provide both rebar accordingly but in exam we might not have time therefore we have to choose one and we have to provide the same in the other direction which will be a, which will be a slightly conservative but it will be correct okay you are not under designing anything so my question is which moment will you consider mx and my when i ask this what i really mean is which moment do you think will be larger will it be mx or will it be my think about it for a moment and try to answer this question my my okay uh anyone would like to add to that see these are very small things and perhaps you know these are the things that uh uh what i would say these are the things that if you you know if your understanding is on the right track then these are the things that you easily understand uh make the procedure anyone can follow not a problem but now what we have learned is we have, we spend some time on actually uh you know knowing how to calculate the moment so we spend some time here Hmm? So a simple question that I'm asking is, if the if the column is rectangular, the footing is square, then which moment will you consider? That will so <clears throat> naturally my question is, which of these moments is greater? So if you consider the greater moment, you will provide greater rebar, and you can provide the same rebar in the perpendicular direction. You are covered. The footing is safe. You're not under designing it. So the question is, which of the moments is greater? Is it MX or is it MY? mx is greater all along the y axis because so okay so to clarify what mx and my is so this is mx so this is moment about x axis and this is my moment about y axis okay so what do you think is greater mx or my about y axis because uh, 
the point is much farther than this okay so actually the answer is opposite of what you just said uh <clears throat> you see we have two distances let's call this as l2 and let's call this as l1 okay so these are span these are spans basically uh, when i'm fi- when i'm finding mx i will use the span as l2 when i'm finding my i'll use the span as l1 now it's it's obvious that l2 is greater than l1 everybody agrees or does it need a need a mathematical you know proof for this it's simple right if this is the shorter side it's a square column it's a square footing so naturally l2 is gr- going to be greater than l1 okay q okay. is same for both it's going to be a rectangular footing that's why no no it's, it's a square footing okay, okay then then about this okay then about x so you know pardon the sketch it's, it might seem like rectangular but you know i've said it multiple times it's square footing so if it's a square footing l2 is greater than l1 q is same now m if you look at the value of m m is q into ll square l is same because it's a square footing q is same because it's a square footing the only thing is l1 and l2 are different so naturally whatever is greater l2 is greater than l1 meaning that mx is greater than my so this is a larger span so naturally there is going to be a larger moment and this correct the direction of moment so if you are considering this the moment is going to be like this so this is mx and this is my so everything remains same you start with uh, try finding out what are the plan dimensions you provide a square footing then this while calculating the moment you just consider the longer span so you consider l2 meaning that you consider mx you just find out what is the moment and everything remains same so this is a shortcut what you should you know actually do or what you should you strictly speaking what should what you should do is you calculate mx you calculate my and provide astx and asty in in the corresponding directions okay does that answer your question yes okay so uh, perhaps i think we are done with all the numericals this was it so i really urge you to uh, it's it's just four types of problems out of which three belong to flexor so there's nothing you know new in this the only the, the procedure to approach those problems is a little different but fundamentally all the concepts remain the same only columns is a little different but the upside is that it is the easiest to fall so uh, you know I, i really would urge you to look at all these numericals not just before the exam but definitely before the revision lecture so that you have a good idea of what you know what we are discussing what you are talking about uh so if there are no questions here uh, perhaps we can declare that the design of reinforced concrete footings is over and we we just have to jump to a few uh, you know miscellaneous topics that um, are to be covered so uh, we just take a short break perhaps a few minutes and then we will start with a new topic uh, um, it's it's not a topic actually it's 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 just a small part of the syllabus this grid flows so it's 10 7 now let's uh, you know start at 10 12 or so okay but if by then there are any questions i'm i'm online <clears throat>
so i can um the next topic of discussion is a part of something that we already seen we've looked at slabs and we've looked at the different types of slabs perhaps it is due to the speciality of you know these slabs or the rarity of these slabs is that we we are discussing it <clears throat> you know as a separate sub topics so grid flows are nothing but flows resting on, on beams running in one or two directions uh, talking about one direction we have looked at uh, what is called as grid slab which uh, perhaps is a type of <clears throat> a one way slab in which the beams are running in only one direction which are closely spaced as compared to when we you know when we compare it with a with with a beam slab system so we have a set of beams that runs only in one directions and they are supported on either primary beams or columns in another direction now uh, in this system the flow just has nominal thickness while the grid of beams is the main supporting systems and such a systems is such a system is normally employed uh, for architectural reasons naturally which are you know suitable for large rooms such as auditoriums festivals theaters showrooms etc wherein you know providing a column free space is the uh, perhaps the main design criteria now you might have seen you might have noticed that this is not a very common system particularly because of the higher cost of the form work and lower fire rating the reason that this system has a lower fire rating is because all the elements are very slender meaning that the slab is very thin the beams are very thin and therefore the fire rating is uh not perhaps it it might not be adequate as to what is required generally we follow a norm of at least you know 2 to 4 hours of fire rating so you know we you have to be careful about it while perhaps not today but you know when tomorrow we are doing actual projects and you are thinking of a waffle slab you are thinking of a tiger slab you always have to you know keep this uh, at the back of your head is you know it can satisfy the fire rating it's always good to consult uh with your uh, with your team who takes care of this and just ensure that you know it has adequate fire rating so we looked at before waffle slab waffle slab is nothing but an assembly of orthogonally intersecting beams placed at regular and i would add, like to add close intervals and interconnected to a slab of nominal thickness so you know you you perhaps you have this definition by heart as of now now when we are placing the beams close to each other what we are structurally doing is we are stiffening the system you know we have looked at the example of how uh, you know uh, how a uh, plain steel uh, i would say plate has very less stiffness when you compare with a steel patra so in in, in a steel patra what you are doing is you are uh, corrugating it or you are stiffening the system similarly here what you are doing is you are bringing smaller sections smaller beam sections which are very close to each other in both the directions so you are really stiffening it you know so basically what it does is it makes the system lighter and stiffer as compared to a flat slab or a flat plate naturally uh, when you reduce the weight of the slab if you have multiple slabs so you you know you can really uh, have a lot of impact on structural design as in you can re really reduce the weight of the vertical framing system you can really really reduce the uh, design of the footings <clears throat> so this these slabs are particularly you know suitable for uh, for uh, spaces which which requires seclusion from from vibrations like labs hospitals air, airports and so on and which are very sensitive to flow deflections as well so you know two criteria one is vibrations another is deflections whenever these criteria are important your you know go to guy is uh, waffle slab um, in general you know if we compare uh, for 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 the same amount of span if we compare uh the concrete quantity and the steel quantity a waffle slab is you know has saves up to about 30% of concrete and 20% of steel as compared to a flat slab now talking about the general you know thumb rules or dimensions that you can start a design of waffle slab there is over the overall depth can be uh, somewhere in between 300 to 600 the slab thickness which you can see it's it's very thin is about 75 to 125 mm the width of the beams is about 125 to 200 mm center to center spacing of beams can be between 600 mm to 1.5 meters and the preferred spans is you know up to 16 meters so uh, anything between 10 to 16 meters you can opt for this type of slab and you can select your dimensions somewhere in this range so that at least visually it looks correct of course there's going there 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 is going to have to be a technical analysis and design as to how what should be the exact dimensions you're not expected to you know learn all this but you should get a feel and you should be able to provide elements that actually look at least structurally correct 
now advantages include obviously it is they are they are you know more they are preferred when when it comes to longer spans they provide better structural stability because we are stiffening it naturally if you are stiffening it we are reducing deflections we are reducing vibrations uh, and along with they of course they appear you know aesthetic then of course they are relatively light therefore lesser foundation cost lesser lesser material in the vertical framing system and therefore lesser cost of the vertical framing system it requires less material as you have seen it requires about 30% less concrete and what 20% uh, less steel as compared to flat slab then excellent vibration control and perhaps it is economical we can say that it is economical only when reusable form work is used if you know there's there's really complicated form of arrangement that you have that requires a custom form work then it is going to be really expensive the downside is that it requires great, greater flow to flow height because you know if you talk about flat plate then you might require a depth of around say 300 max 350 but still you you are not going as deep as you know 4 uh, 500 600 and so on so naturally this requires a greater flow to flow height you know everything comes at a cost then since you know the the, the geometry is a little complex and uh, you have to be very precise while spacing these they are already thin so there is less margin for error say imagine you have a 100 thick slab or 75 thick slab and you know the 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 form work is going up and down so you know that that's something you cannot afford so there has to be skilled labor for this construction then uh, it requires special or proprietary form work which is costly not every contractor you know has uh, this form work for waffle slab so there has to be a specialized contractor a specialized you know form work consultant for this type of work it is difficult to maintain naturally there are there are so many surfaces there so there are so many faces you know it's a flat slab it's easier to clean it's easier to maintain but when it comes to this if it is not maintained properly you might just lose the entire uh, reason for which you build that type of slab for aesthetics and you might, if it is not maintained properly there are going to be you know webs and there's going to be a lot of dust because the number of surfaces are more therefore it is very difficult to maintain uh we talked about this low fire rating due to thin members fire rating is a function of the thickness of the member the thicker the member the better is its fire uh rating because you uh, you provide you know m- m- there's more amount of concrete there's there's a better cover to the reinforcement and therefore there's a there's a better fire rating here the members are thin the reinforcement has very small cover and therefore the fire rating is also small now there's always a question of services when it comes to waffle slabs where where do pass the services it is below this is it below the beams it is through the beams and so on there are a lot of options but if it is passed through the beams then again the entire point of providing waffle slab which is the the an important reason for providing waffle slabs it's aesthetics is again gone and that degrades the appearance of the exposed waffle slab so you know always keep services in mind always you know have a discussion tomorrow when you're doing an actual project always you know coordinate this with the mep consultants at a very early stage as to you know if i'm providing waffle slab how are the services going to go because you really don't want to see all those holes in you know in your beams at regular intervals so you know just make sure that you take care of this in your actual project now another type of diagrid slab uh, perhaps less commonly used and used only when uh, you know there are really complex geometries is what is called as di- diagrid slab this is nothing but a portmanteau of diagonal grid so in this the beams uh, uh, so the beams are not along the span so the beams are perhaps at an angle angle to the slab and so it is nothing but a framework of diagonally interesting uh, intersecting concrete beams uh, that is used in the construction of buildings and roofs and this is only preferred in case of complex geometries and curved supports so you know waffle slab itself is a little complex and you know you really don't want to further provide a diagonal grid and then make it more complex so but if your support is say not orthogonal not it's it's not a regular grid of columns uh, in both the directions so if it's a curved support or complex geometries it is only in that case you can look at the use of diagrid slabs otherwise you know pro- provision of waffle slab is more than enough so i i i believe this is all that we you know need to know about what are grid slabs so if you have any questions uh, we can discuss them else we can jump on to the next topic um i had a question yeah so uh, it's related to the ids project that um, uh, my span is slightly greater than 16 meters it's about 17.5 so in yeah. that case uh, do we increase the depth of the waffle because i have taken it approximately 700 so that should suffice that i think that should suffice so okay. so 16 so 
So 16, this, the, what the slide says, these, these are just guidelines. It's okay if you're a little here and there. This is just to give you a, a range in which you can operate a waffle snap. It's okay if it's 17.5, 18, okay, it is, it is not the end of the world. This is just, this is not the Lakshman Treka. That is, if you cross it, you're, you're just gone. So these are just guidelines. You can always, you know, go 5, 10% here and there. That's fine. The, the reason for, you know, giving a limit is, it's not that you have a span of 24 meter and still you're considering waffle slabs. So, you know, just, it's it's fine if it's a little more or less. That works. Okay. And another thing uh, uh, regarding how do we support the waffle, like um, uh, it just a, uh, not the drop panel, but uh, 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 yeah, maybe uh, the thing you see in this image is that enough, or do we also have to give beam strips in the uh, in between? No, no, this that is enough. It? This is more than enough. Okay. The entire point of providing is a awful slab to get rid of bigger beams. So, okay. so you know, you just have to have adequate uh, shear strength at the support and for that if you have a plain section around the column and then a waffle slab all around I think that should suffice okay all right thank you yeah okay if there are no more questions we'll jump to our next topic which is steel com concrete composite construction now this is one of the projects that we did a few years back and we had a site visit a couple of years ago and I, I, I would like to say that this was one of the cleanest sites that I've ever seen. And naturally, the reason was it was a composite structure, very clean, you know, very, you know, it was, it was, the spans were adequate. <clears throat> uh, and we, okay, the only, the point is that it was one of the cleanest sites because of, because the construction was composite, you could see, you know, the sections were small and, uh, Aesthetically, it looked really good, not only from, you know, the, the image that I've shown, but if you actually go into the structure, even there, none of the, you know, none of the components of the structure look really bulky or look really ugly. And I believe the reason was because it was a composite construction. Therefore, the columns could be smaller. The, you know, the slab thickness was smaller and, you know, everything looked pretty good. So, <clears throat> composite uh, a structural uh, a composite structural member is made up of two or more different materials fundamentally what we do is we just take properties of each material and combine them to form a single unit that has an overall better performance than its separate constituent parts now in construction there are a number of composites that you can use there's steel timber timber concrete plastic concrete and so on but the most common is steel concrete and basically when we are studying reinforced concrete itself is a composite material but when we specifically say that we are looking at steel concrete composite, we are not using steel in the form of reinforcement, but, so let me uh, reiterate this. We are not using steel only as reinforcement, but also we are using structural steel sections. Perhaps I would just give, uh, yeah. So this image first, so that you understand the difference between reinforced concrete. So reinforced concrete is a composite material, but you're using steel only as, only to reinforce it, okay? But in steel concrete composite, you are using steel not only as a reinforcement, but also as uh, structural members. So that's the difference between reinforced concrete and composite uh, steel concrete. So uh, the working principle remains the same, the working principle that we have seen in reinforced concrete. Concrete is really good in compression, very weak in tension. Steel, on the other hand, is very strong in tension, and it can resist a significant amount of tensile forces even in small areas. And steel also good in compression. So when we combine, you know, the powers of the two, what we get, the end result is a highly efficient and lightweight unit that is not only strong in compression, but also in tension. So the working principle is the same. Now, uh, this system perhaps is, uh, has worldwide acceptance as an alternative to steel concrete. It offers common solutions that are economically competitive. Now, in almost all the retrofit projects, wherein, you know, a structure is already being built and there are changes that the client wants, there are some changes that the architect wants. Almost everywhere we go for a composite system. Maybe, you know, deleting some slab, adding some slab, or, you know, adding some beams, adding an extension to the existing structure. So whatever retrofitting, you know, uh, uh, retrofitting activities, we perhaps look at composite, you know, as the, as the first solution. <clears throat> So uh, the primary compo components of steel concrete composite are obviously composite slabs, composite beams, and composite columns. 
have we looked at a composite foundation anyone so when we studied foundation i'm not talking about this semester only so when you study foundation any time do you remember if we looked at composite foundations um would grillage foundation count yes yes very good answer so grillage foundation we looked at that wherein there's a you know set of steel beams orthogonal to each other in different layers and everything is covered in concrete that is a form of a composite composite foundation but it is very 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 rare and therefore you know i'm not into it here and we have already looked at it so this is how a composite slab looks like so there's a steel decking yeah uh, it it might have a shape of a uh, it might resemble the shape of a trapezium as well trapezium uh, decking trapezoidal tra decking or it might have a shape of a reentrant so we look at it later that is called as reentrant decking the concept being that there is this steel decking and there is this nominal reinforcement that you provide in both the directions and the concrete sort of sits on it so that's that's a simple uh, you know we are explain com composite slabs so typically constructed as reinforced concrete slab cast over profiled steel decking and the overall depth is somewhere is at least 130 mm now the function the, the steel decking has uh, sort of dual role here first is that it acts as a form work and a working platform during construction so when we are dealing with uh, the composite slabs the steel decking itself acts as a form work perhaps that is the reason why that the site looked slow so clean because there almost no way there was uh, a lot of form work and it then it, uh, during the actual uh, functional stage it acts on external reinforcement so the reinforcement is not in the form of bars but it is a form of a steel decking so the concrete and steel of course we we'll, we'll see how they are connected to each other and how does a for, force transfer occurs but during the functional stage it acts as an external reinforcement reinforced concrete on the other hand so the the question is can you use only a steel profile decking the answer is no because naturally it's it's not going to be as stiff as concrete and therefore it it might undergo a lot of reflections you can just imagine it there's only a profile digging there's no concrete you so you you just kind of get a feeling that it is going to deflect a lot and it is not going to be you know resistant to vibrations of course the vibrations are going to be all, all over the place and there's going to be no fiber or thermal protection at, at all so that is the reason we provide concrete over the steel decking because it stiffens when it stiffens it naturally reduces the deflections it it naturally reduces the vibrations and uh, concrete naturally has a better protection to fire and thermal insulation so this is how a typical uh, uh, layout for a uh, composite slab look, looks like so you can see a grid of columns so the beams that uh, are connecting to the column in y directions are are your primary beams and the beams that are connecting to either the columns or the primary beams are your secondary beams and uh, your composite slab sort of sits on the secondary beams in this direction so your profile will be in this direction and there'll be concrete over it the thumb rule that we follow is that we do not go for a span which is more than 3 meters at least for a so what i mean by that is the secondary beam should not be located at a distance of greater than 3 meters recently we did you know a youth study when we were where we were studying the possibility of composite system for a uh, for a mall that that was to be that is that was planned to be built in mumbai and you know that there was there was we extensively studied the system and the thumb rule that we followed is you know there has to be a primary beam along the shorter direction so you you also have you, you can also do it other way okay i'll just tell you what i mean by this so this is one way of doing it the other way of doing it is that you have columns here and you provide primary beams like this okay and you provide secondary beams like this perhaps you have a different color and you use secondary beams like this Perhaps I'll use a rectangle for column. Okay. 
so do you notice the difference between these two, these two systems so what we have done here is we have provided primary beams along the longer span the load remains the same but we have provided primary beams along the longer span what happens in that case is you get a larger section for a primary beam and uh, the, the the secondary beam section might remain the same but definitely if you are going for a this type of system if your primary beam is along the longer span you are going to get a greater dimension so the thumb rule being all your primary beam should be along the shorter span so this is a 7 meters by 6.7.5 uh, meters by 6 meters span so your primary beams are going to be along the shorter span and then the secondary beams are going to be along the longer span <coughs> this is a typical framing of composite slab so yes there are two uh deckings that are commonly used a re-entrant decking or a trapezoidal decking uh when i say depth of these deckings it is the distance between the trough and the uh crest and the trough so that's that's what what is the depth so a depth of normally 50 to 60 mm is, suff is sufficient for spans up to three meters and this is what we normally use uh, i've told you before that we sort of restrict ourselves to a span of three meters but in extraordinary cases the span is say Four meters or more, then go out for a depth of 80 meters. And in very, very, very rare situations, wherein you want to span six meters and above, you go have to go for a deep decking, which is about 200 mm. So now you can see that this is the depth of the decking only. Then you will have concrete above it, so 75 mm concrete and so and so on. So basically, you are losing uh, the purpose of providing this. You can go really shallow with a steel deck. And now for six meters and above, you require 275, 300. You can work with a flat slab. There's, there's no need to go for a composite slab. So, you know, it's uh, just this. The first one is, I think it's it's okay uh, for design. If, if you're actually framing, if you're actually working on the frame of composite slabs, perhaps, you know, this is the, the depth and this is the span that you can work with. Now, just a few uh, salient points about the profile decking. You you may you you may see that there are these corrugations uh, very closely located to each other, and these are nothing but they serve as a key for the concrete to you know interlock. So the concrete interlocks with the with the steel decking with the help of these uh, corrugations or with the help of these keys. Now you might notice that there's also a reentrant corner at the top. Now if if it's a plain if it's a plain section here, what might happen is it might undergo local buckling because it it also has some span. There's concrete on the top of it. There's going to be a dead load, live load, uh, superimposed dead load, and so on. So there's a chance that this might uh, actually locally buckle. To avoid that, what what is being given is a uh, reentrant stiffener. So this stiffens the section and reduces the deflections. Then another, uh, and I think uh, a very important uh, section is a composite column. So you can do it two ways. You can either put concrete inside steel. Or you can put steel inside concrete. Okay, so when you uh, put uh, steel inside concrete, the resulting section is called as concrete encased steel section. And when you fill concrete inside hollow steel sections, it is called as concrete filled hollow steel sections. Uh, uh, I don't remember the, the abbreviation that we commonly use. Uh, CFTs, concrete filled tubes. That that's the abbreviation that we use. So perhaps this is the you know this is the best use of uh this is an ideal way of combining concrete reinforcing steel and structural steel because you know concrete is is uh the the concrete is in it is basically used uh for okay let me put it this way so concrete is very strong in compression you can expect high high compression stresses in, in in columns and therefore it is the best use of concrete steel it doesn't matter tension or compression it it it, it has equal strength so an ideal way of combining all the powers or the, all the you know all the qualities of concrete steel and structural steel is use it in the form of composite columns you will see that such a, such a type of system is more preferred in commercial establishments it it may be malls or you know it may be uh, so wherever you require maximum usable floor space because especially in commercial establishment the cost of you know the cost per square foot is very high so if you can really work on reducing the size of the column, then you basically are you know, making a lot of money for the client. So naturally, they are preferred you know, in commercial establishments like offices, shops, malls, and so on. Now, uh, as, as I mentioned before, there are two types. 
you see the first three the first three fall under the category of concrete encased section so there is a steel section within uh, within concrete so in 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 type 2 perhaps the two sections uh, two faces are exposed in type 1 none of the sections are exposed and in fourth all the faces are exposed the other way of doing it is there's a tube there's a hollow tube it may be rectangular square and so on and concrete is filled inside it with a nominal amount of reinforcement and the third way which uh, in which we can combine both is that there's a steel tube uh, at the outer face then there's concrete and there's an eye section within that so there this is uh, sort of a combination of both of them so this is concrete filled circular section with additional line with additional eye section perhaps a very tight situation this might this might be used uh so the advantage that the first type gives is that concrete uh, protects steel from naturally from corrosion and fire and the advantage that we have in a second type of system is that <coughs> the concrete is encased in the steel tube and therefore it sort of prevents the steel tube from locally buckling so we have seen that in corporation members buckling is a very important design criteria local buckling global buckling and so on so so if you have something to you know stiffen it from inside there's it it reduces the uh, it prevents the section from buckling locally so i believe uh, we'll just stop here for now the only thing that is pending in this topic is composite beams we'll look at it in the next lecture and a few other topics uh perhaps i'll just give you a summary of what is remaining yeah so we have spent a lot of time on number 2 then we have finished topic number 3 also rectangular decorated tie grid we have finished uh the theory of flat slabs with column capital drop panel drop panel flat plate and so on a few topics are left is pre cast concrete elements its applications and suitability so we'll spend some time on this in the next lecture and perhaps wind up topics number 2 3 and 4 uh, neeraj has covered topic number 1 and uh, if you have any questions regarding it perhaps next lecture is the last time you can ask it um so it also depends upon how much time do we have so if you there's any specific topic that you want me to explain from section 1 you just let me know in advance we'll we we'll take a look at it uh so two lectures to go i think the next lecture should be sufficient to wind up whatever is left and we'll reserve the final lecture for revision so if there are no questions then i think we are good to go for today i just record attendance yeah so any questions in what we have learned today yeah i just have a small question yeah go uh, on in the six uh, six types of uh, sections that you showed us the concrete and steel uh, combinations yes yeah so uh, for the fourth one uh, is it the difference between this and normal rcc is it the member sizes of steel because okay. rcc also has this right yes but rcc does not have this steel section on the outer side okay okay all right Yeah. So right. yeah, perhaps that I should have pointed that out. Yeah. That the dark line that you see is actually a steel section. This is a hollow <laughs> rectangular tube. This is a hollow circular tube. All right, all right. Perhaps Thank this will you. be. So this is what the section is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hello. Yeah. Uh, how much does it uh, exceed the cost, uh, like overall? Uh, uh in the composite or uh, uh like using the composite materials so it is it is you know not a straightforward uh, question to answer because it is uh always going to be dependent on a number of factors firstly how much is the scale of the project so how much so so what we follow is we sort of first develop a framing for both systems because the spans uh 
the spans and, and the size of sections might be different in both the systems. So, and uh, the next step is how much space are we really saving? And the third step is what is the cost of the space that we have saved? And the fourth step is what is the total cost of uh, you know, the construction of one type of system and the other, other type of system? Now, if I have to give an example, uh, so we studied three systems for a recent project. So we studied an entire steel system, we studied a steel composite system, and we studied a concrete system. Now, in terms of space, yes, we were saving a lot of space when we when we were using a composite system. But in terms of cost, the reinforced concrete system proved to be, you know, uh, the, the cheapest one. And you, know, it is it is always uh, you always try to balance to you always try to strike a balance between you know the cost of the space and the cost of the construction. So the client went ahead with the reinforced concrete even though the sections were larger. So it depends on number of factors and never state, you know, there, there's an extensive study that has to be undertaken to understand which system is really most efficient in terms of cost. Okay, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so thank you for today. We'll meet on next Saturday, same time. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, I had a question regarding the uh, diagram.